Well, if you have a Bible, please do turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And I'm going to read that chapter. To verse 29. You've heard the expression, a political football. Uh, Paul, in the last chapters of Acts, has been kicked around like a political football. The Jews um, in Jerusalem want to uh, uh, bring charges against him. Paul has appealed to Caesar. At this point, we are in Caesarea. Paul has languished in prison for two years. Uh, The proconsul, Felix, has finished. A new one, Festus, has started. Festus is, is, if you like, going through his entry, and he has to decide what the charges are against Paul. He um, is visited by uh, King Agrippa. King Agrippa is a great-grandson of Herod the Great. We read about uh, uh, Jesus' birth. King Agrippa had a small section um, of of lands, not not in Israel, that he was ruler of, but he was also the person who decided who the chief priest was. King Agrippa has some experience in Jewish customs. So Festus and Agrippa, with all their nobles, and King Agrippa's, um, well, really, uh, it's his half-sister, who is with him, who he's in a relationship with, Bernice. And they're examining Paul. And uh, in Acts 26, we get Paul's defense. There's so much drama here as Paul explains about his call and his mission. And he talks about his commissioning by the risen Lord Jesus. So let's read Acts 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised to our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme in my obsession. Against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant 
and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles also, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long. I pray, God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today will become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. I want to draw your attention this morning in that chapter to verse 18. We're just going to look at verse 18. The risen Lord Jesus says to Saul, I am sending you to them, the Gentiles, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and find a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What does the risen Lord Jesus Christ send his people into the world to do? What is the impact of Jesus Christ, the servant of the Lord, and of his servant people on the nations of the world? The Bible is like a wonderful orchard filled with gospel fruits and the chapters are branches, the books are the trees, 66 trees and uh, verses are, are lovely apples that we can pick. And so in these summer Sundays, we're looking at, at just individual verses, gospel fruits. And last week we looked at a well-known verse, John 3 verse 16. Acts 26 verse 18 is less well known, but it is a wonderful summary of the purpose of the gospel, of what the Lord Jesus does in history. It's a summary of the purpose of the ministry of the Apostle Paul as he recounts his calling and conversion on the Damascus roads. These are the words of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. It's more accurate to say that it's the Acts of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's what the Lord Jesus continued to do in the world through his gospel. And uh, I was really helped by a comment on this verse by a Bible commentator I find really helpful, John Calvin. He said this, we are given here 
the drift of the gospel. The drift of the gospel. You might say to somebody, do you catch my drift? Do you know my intention? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know where I'm going with this? Where does the gospel go in the world? What does it do? You're on holiday. You're on the beach. You're on your lilo. And uh, you've decided to relax in the waves. And there you are. Sun, hopefully it's going to be sunny this week. And you're caught by a current. And you're taking a long, long way. Current transports you. It's a drift. It pushes you in a certain direction. There are many, many currents in this world, many ideas, many drifts, many powers, many ideas that take you in a certain direction. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel is a power. It's God's power for salvation. It is a drift. It's a current. It will take you somewhere. It has this impact on the world and on history. Where does it take us? What would the purpose of Paul's ministry, uh, uh, a, a rebel against God, yet picked up by the risen Lord Jesus to be his chosen representative, to take the message of his sufferings and resurrection to the nations? Where does the gospel take us? Where does it bring us? What is the drift of the gospel? And verse 18 puts it so simply. So if you're not a Christian this morning and, and you are weighing up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as he speaks to you, where will it take me? If I give myself to the Lord Jesus Christ, if I believe that he's risen from the dead, where will this gospel take me? What will it do in my life? Well, verse 18 sums it up so well. If I am a Christian and I've embraced the Lord Jesus in my life, what, what has happened? What has the gospel done in my life? And as churches together, what is it that the Lord Jesus sends us into the world to do? We're not apostles. We're not Pauls. And yet we hold to the same gospel. What is the drift of the gospel? Well, I'm going to give you three things. But before I do, two things just to bear in mind. Because we're picking gospel fruits, but we, we don't want to take it out of context. So two things you need to see in this verse. Firstly, you need to see the drama of the situation. This is Paul's last defense before he goes to Rome, where he will witness for the gospel before the emperor himself, Nero. And so Paul is on trial. And you can imagine a great hall like this. And all the bigwigs walk in with Festus and Agrippa and Bernice. And they're one wearing wonderful, shiny clothes. And uh, they're all lined up. And they call this man who's been in prison two years. And uh, I doubt Paul was wearing wonderful, shiny clothes and a tie. There is a, a humble, persecuted, suffering man, hated by so many, and you think he's on trial, but he speaks to the Lord Jesus. And by the end of the speech, the tables are turned. And Paul is not just defending himself. He's actively bearing witness to the Lord Jesus Christ to such a stone that Felix, all this powerful man, Festus, I mean, shouts out, you're out of your mind. He's scared. Something about the gospel that, that can scare us because it, it places these demands on us. It's, it's wonderfully true and, and compelling. It becomes Paul's personal plea. So we, we can't miss the great drama of what Paul is saying here. But also, we can't miss a, a deeper story. The risen Lord Jesus said, I am sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. Paul's conversion is very much like the, the calling of a prophet in the Old Testament, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. And in fact, the language of the book of Acts and Luke, I was absolutely astounded this week to see how many references there are to the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord's servant, Israel, the nation, has been blind and dumb 
and disobedience. But the Lord says that he will raise up a servant like Israel who will proclaim uh, light to, to Israel, but all nations. You get Isaiah's wonderful servant songs. And Paul sees his mission as part of that mission. The servant of the Lord Jesus sends his servant out. So this is a huge theme that's here. So Paul's journey to Rome and standing on trial before a Roman governor and a Jewish king, he is following in the same steps as the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to Jerusalem and stood on trial before a Roman governor and Jewish kings and leaders. Paul is following in the steps of the suffering servants, the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're to see. So what is the impact of the gospel? What would be the impact of Paul's ministry on the nations? What did the risen Lord Jesus say? I am sending you to them, to the Gentiles. The Gentiles and the Jews will rebel against Paul and his ministry. They will uh, persecute him. But the very ones who will persecute Paul, the very ones who the Lord Jesus will rescue him from, are the very ones that the Lord is sending him to. This is the God who loves his enemies, who has a gracious plan to save and rescue. What is the impact of the gospel on the world? Three things from these verses. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ brings glorious light, brings radical change, and it brings wonderful blessings. Glorious light, wonderful change, radical change and wonderful blessings. First of all, glorious light. I am sending you, what are you sending Paul to the Gentiles to do, the Lord Jesus? I am sending you to them to open their eyes. Once upon a time, Jesus Christ was walking to Jerusalem and he had to go through Jericho. And as he was walking, there was a blind beggar on the side of the road. And he heard that Jesus was going past. And the beggar said, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd told him to be quiet. But the more they told him to be quiet, the louder he shouted, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and came to him and said, um, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind beggar said, Lord, I want to see. And Jesus laid his hands on him and the eyes of a blind man who could see nothing but darkness were open. And he followed Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, on the road to the cross. But do you see that that blind man, before his eyes were physically opened, he could already see something wonderful. He already saw that Jesus was the Messiah, the son of David. And again and again in Luke's gospel, Jesus opens the eyes of the physically blind, but also he opens the eyes of the spiritually blind, who don't see who God is, who are either Jewish and have weird ideas and strange ideas about how God will rescue his people. He brings that into sharpest and clearest focus to Gentiles who don't know anything about God, who have no hope and no God in the world, who are in the darkness. Jesus opens their eyes to see that he is the light. He is God's own son. The impact of Jesus the servant on the nations is that he opens our eyes. We are in darkness. We don't know who God is. We don't know where we are or what we're about, but Jesus opens our eyes. I read once about the preaching of Christians in Northumberland in the medieval times, and this was early so there were kind of Saxons or Viking types in their big long huts. And a Christian missionary came to one of these big long huts with the, the chief. And you can imagine the big fire. I imagine uh, that Vikings didn't wear big horned hats, but I, I imagine it like that, um, like a Lord of the Rings type thing. They're in this big hut. And um, the Christian is telling them about Jesus. 
And they say, please tell us, because this life is like a sparrow in the darkness. We briefly come into the hut and we're in the light. And then we leave out through the window into the darkness. You can imagine it, can't you? They say, please tell us, because we don't know where we've come from. We're in this life for a brief time. And then we disappear in the darkness and we don't know what we're, where we're going. And so the missionary told them about Jesus because Jesus opens the eyes of the nations wherever we're from to see that there is a God beforehand who made everything, who sent his son, a God of love, a God who has a rescue plan to save us, a God who sent his son to die for us. Jesus opens our eyes. He shows us who God is. There's many movements in the world that claim to see the light. People say, I was listening to Cat Stevens at Glastonbury, and he played a song by one of the Beatles and said, uh, oh, I've got him, George Harrison, to thank for leading me east so I could see the light. There's all kinds of people who say, I've seen the light about this, I've seen the light about that. People even call the age of reason the age of enlightenment. We're rational. But above everything and exclusively, it's Christianity. It's Jesus who shows us the light about who we are and where we're from. And this is not some kind of weird inner light where I say, oh, I've seen the light. Well, you can't question it because I've seen the light. At the end of Paul's speech, Festus is saying, you're out of your mind, Paul. And Paul says, no, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. Christianity is true and reasonable. This is what happened in history. This is a, a historical resurrection. This is the scriptures are proof of this. You're not weird if you're a Christian. You're not unhistorical or ignorant. This is true and rational. This is reasonable. But it's the light of who God is that has come into our lives. So where is the drift of the gospel? Where will the gospel take you? It will open your eyes. It brings us wonderful light to see who God is. And as Christians, we need to pick this up to each other, that the Bible and the message of the resurrection give us values about human life and where we're going and purpose and meaning that the world around us is saying, oh, yeah, we don't want Christianity, but it wants to hold on to those values. Or we could say, this is where it comes from. This is what Jesus has done in history. He's opened up the eyes of the blinds. This is what Jesus does. So the flow of the gospel brings us glorious lights. The second thing I want to say is the message of the risen Lord Jesus brings radical change. Look at the verse again. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. So it doesn't just show us the lights, it turns us. So it's not like the gospel, we're in prison in the darkness, and oh look, out there's a light. The gospel, actually, Jesus actually comes into the prison, takes us out of the prison, and brings us outside. It actually gives us freedom. So the gospel shows us light, but it brings this wonderful transformation. Behind what Paul is saying here is the understanding that after Adam and Eve's rebellion against God's, all the nations of this world were in darkness and under the reign and rule of Satan. Satan says when he's tempting Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, um, he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. There's a little phrase. He said, all of these are mine. Uh, and we, we're not to think that Satan showed Jesus there just the kingdoms of the world necessary at that moment. All the kingdoms of the world throughout history are under the power of Satan. The Apostle John says in 1 John, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. What does that mean? Because of humanity's rebellion against God, 
Satan, God's adversary, who's not equal with God at all, is the deceitful ruler of this world. So even if you're out and out pagan into evil and it's dominating your life, or you're nice and tidy, think you're reasonable, Satan is at work to blind you from the light and you are under his power, following his way. The New Testament again and again talks about the gospel and Jesus' work as victory over Satan. There's this power that is dominating the world that is evil, that we need to be set free from. And the message of the Lord Jesus brings radical change. It turns us from that power, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan and its corruption and its lies to the power of God and his goodness, and his truth, and his justice, and his joy. Paul could write to a church in Colossae and say that when they became um, Christians, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, he has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. And that happened in Jesus' ministry, didn't it? With a demon-possessed man, brought out the power of darkness into the power of God. That happened in Paul's ministry when he was in Philippi and there was this little slave girl possessed by a demon and she was delivered. This is what the gospel does. It's not just an idea. The risen Lord Jesus, as we trust the gospel, it's a power that takes us out of the rule of darkness into the rule of light. How does that happen? Well, Paul says... I send you to open their eyes. Jesus opens our eyes to turn them from darkness. It happens when we repent. So we believe, that's the command to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in all that God has done through him. As we do that, there's this change that happens. Repentance. There's no salvation without repentance. That's what is required, Paul later says in his speech, that that, uh, repentance is required to everyone, small and great alike. What is repentance? It's a change of direction. It's turning from false lights and false guards and a false idea of myself. It's turning from darkness to light. I'm to do it. I'm to repent. But it's interesting here, Paul said, uh, the Lord Jesus says to Paul, you turn them, you turn them. How does that happen? Well, by the Spirit, God, through Paul's ministry, will powerfully turn people. We're to repent, but God does it by his Spirit. He turns us. We've got to change direction. You'll know if you're on holiday or if you're a local here, there's a bus that comes from our village called the Trouse. Um, And the Trouse goes from Bangor to Aberystwyth. Now, imagine I get on the wrong bus stop and on the wrong side of the roads, and I want to go to Bangor, but I get on the Trouse and uh, I find it's going to Aberystwyth. Oh, I'm headed on the wrong direction. Now, I can feel sorry about that. Oh. Dear, I won't get to go to Bangor. But that's not repentance. I can feel bad about it. Oh, but I'm still on the bus. Oh, there goes uh, Charles Vanith. There goes Dargekhle. Never mind. I'm still heading in the wrong direction. Repentance would be at the next bus stop, getting off the bus, crossing the road, and heading in the right direction. Now, have you done that? Because that's what the gospel does. It opens our eyes. It powerfully turns us in the right direction towards God. And you think, oh, how can I do that? How can I repent? God does it. He will help you. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him. He powerfully turns us. Let's look at our verse. The gospel brings wonderful light, radical change, and it brings glorious blessings. I am sending you to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that. Why does the Lord Jesus, through the gospel, open our eyes? Why does he turn us from one kingdom to another? 
so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. There was a man who was paralyzed and his friends wanted him to see Jesus. They believed that Jesus could cure him. And the crowd was so great in the house that they couldn't get in. So they took this man up on the roof. They made a hole in the roof and they winched him down into the room. And the Lord Jesus looked at him and he said a thing that really set the cat amongst the pigeons. If he'd have said, you are healed, it wouldn't have caused so much controversy. What Jesus said was, son, your sins are forgiven. The people, the Pharisees were incensed. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus again and again proclaims forgiveness of sins. And, and Jesus says to his disciples in Acts 24, the risen Lord Jesus says, I am sending you, this is what the scripture said, that Christ must suffer and rise and then repentance and forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Forgiveness of sins. You can be forgiven your sins. God can look at you and say, not guilty, not deserving of any punishment. This is the blessing of Jesus Christ and the gospel for the nations. You can be forgiven. I have a friend who before uh, he was a Christian, spent a lot of time in the pub, played rugby, hard drinking person. And he used to say that uh, there was a slate in the pub with everybody's tab of what they owed. And, uh, and his slate was quite big. But when he became a Christian, he said he realized that the slate of what I owed God on the back of the boards was wiped clean, justified, not guilty, right with God, forgiven. If you're a Christian, what does Jesus do in our lives? He opens our eyes. He powerfully takes us out to another kingdom. And he confers this incredible blessing, forgiveness. I was hearing a guy last year. There's great fruit in um, Iran at the moment. Many people becoming Christians. They say, um, how, how have you made a connection with Iranians, with the gospel? He said, well, everybody wants to be forgiven. He said, it's that simple. Do you want to be forgiven? And the, and the gospel does that, forgiveness of sins, but there's more great blessings. Look at the verse. I am sending you to them to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins, forgiveness and something more, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. West Side Story. Who is it? Maria? Tony? There's a place for us. Somewhere a place for us. A place. What does the gospel give us? Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Something like, oh, that's the one singing. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Um, so gospel gives us a place. A place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, the church, Israel, but the true church of all those who believe in Jesus, Jew and Gentile, are sanctified. They are set apart. They are holy. So to trust in the Lord Jesus, what does he do in our lives? He forgives us. He takes us from darkness to light. But we're part of his people. We're part of his holy ones. We're given a place in his church. And we're also given an inheritance, a place in heaven forever. This is what the gospel does in the lives of the nations. Isn't it wonderful? If you're anything like me, when I first started hanging around with Christians in Christian Union when I was at university, after wandering, I met these lovely people, but I'd wandered in the world and I felt dirty. Have you ever felt like you don't deserve to be there? Like you're the ugly duckling, you're the odd one out in church, and there's all these lovely people. You can feel like that. Well, 
What the gospel does is gives us a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in the Lord Jesus. If we're right with God through Jesus, by grace, we're in part of his people. What a wonderful thing. If you're a Christian and you're looking at the shed blood of Jesus, you have as much right to be part of the church as anybody else, because it is for sinners. Isn't that wonderful? And you can't be a Christian, really, without wanting to be part of the church. That's the blessing. The blessing of the gospel is I get to be part of his church, and I get to be part of his people, and one day his inheritance forever. So you see, this is the drift of the gospel. This is the flow of the gospel. This is where the, the witness of the risen Lord Jesus takes us. It opens our eyes. Wonderful light. Powerfully transforms us. Radical change. Darkness to light. Power of Satan to God. It gives blessings. It opens eyes. It gives us forgiveness and a place in his people and in glory. So if you're not a Christian, with Paul, I want to persuade you to be a Christian. This is where the gospel will take you. Believe in the Lord Jesus as your light. Believe, ask him to transform your life. Come to him. Believe him for a forgiveness of sins. But let him give you a place amongst his people. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Second thing, if you are a Christian, this is the drift of the gospel in, in your life. This is what he's done. Sometimes we can drift all over the place as Christians. What has God done? What is he doing? What is it all about? What has happened to me? My eyes have been opened. Power of Satan to the power of God. Forgiveness of sins and a place amongst his people. Blessed be his name. Second, third, this is what I want to leave you with. We're not Paul. We're not prophets and apostles. But if we're Christians and we're part of the church, this is what Jesus sends us into the world to do. If we believe Paul's gospel, if we follow Paul's example, if we want his character, if we are lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the point of the church we're in the world to win it. We've been sent into the world because the Lord Jesus wants to open the eyes of the blind. He wants to release captives from the power of Satan to the power of God. He wants to bring forgiveness of sins and a place amongst his people. This is the role of the church. So wherever there's integrity, like Paul shows here, wherever there's true gospel witness, like Paul shows here, wherever there's a willingness to suffer, like Paul shows here, God is at work to open the eyes of the blind. Churches come in all different shapes and sizes. We've got all different practices and habits. But at its core, the church are servants of the Lord sent into the world. That is the purpose. That's why we're here. So you can't read this verse as a gospel summary, without thinking, what's our role? What are we here for? Jesus is the great servant of the Lord. We are his servants, the very ones who are in the darkness, who might kick at us and despise our message, are the very ones we're called to reach. And nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. So I think this verse challenges us to be humble servants like Paul, willing to go so that others might see the truth of the gospel. A long time ago, I was in West Wales, and um, we've been on the beach, like many of you are hoping to be on the beach this week. And I was with a little boy. The tide was coming in, and I was showing this little boy how to dig a trench for the tide to come through onto the beach. And as we were digging the trench, the little boy looked around and uh, saw that people were moving their deck chairs and their picnic mats and everything to get away from the tides. And the boy said to me with a guilty conscience, Daddy, oh, we didn't say that, oh, it's anonymous. He said to me, look, look, um, we better stop 
We're flooding the beach. We're flooding the beach. I said, um, we're not flooding the beach. We can't make the tide come in. All we can do is dig a channel. We're just digging a channel. What are we doing as churches and Christians? We don't open the eyes of the nations. We don't bring people from darkness to light. The Lord does it. What are we? We're channels. Paul was a channel. So the Lord could say, I am sending you to this, to do this. But by his spirit and by his word, the Lord was at work. And I think we need to read this and say, and I need to say to myself and you, are we channels? Are we willing to suffer? Are we willing to go? Are we sent? Because this is the whole purpose of Jesus in the world, is to open the eyes of the blind, to bring the nations. The tide is coming in. Nothing can stop the Lord saving. Are we willing servants for his purposes? Great is the gospel of our glorious God. Shall we sing together and then we'll pray.